over the course of the next two to four months. There are still a number of elderly patients in the community and most of these have either age-related problems or vascular problems. So diabetes is a huge one and uh, a group of these patients are actually under the shielded category where the government has asked them to stay at home for 12 weeks. So we've been in discussion amongst ourselves with the consultants whether we send somebody out to see them or bring them into the hospital because these patients are in quarantine for 12 weeks for their protection and coming to see us at St Thomas's may be putting them at risk given we're quite a big COVID centre. But if it's something like an only eye and it's something that's going to be visually debilitating for the rest of the patient's lives, it's really important that we still try and coordinate this to make the patient have the best opportunity to regain their sight after this pandemic is over. So with St. Thomas's Hospital, we've got a long corridor and the, thank you, Patricia, and the side entrance from the Avelina Center on the Lambeth side of the entrance to St. Thomas's. If we coordinate it in advance, we can have somebody receive a vulnerable patient from the exit straight into the casualty department and bring them out. So the key thing to remember for shielded patients is to keep them safe at home they should have access to phone numbers for people to drop off food parcels and people to help them with communications. And then your role is to call us in our casualty or Kings or some of the other centers that you think would be most appropriate and then have a very bespoke arrangement for that shielded patient so that they're not waiting around and they come straight into the eye casualty, have their assessment and treatment and go home. Okay, so we will talk about the video consults. Several of you have tried it and clinic.co clinic .co seems to work quite well. And um, the, the, the other ones that have been suggested can be shared in this chat group. And it's important to make sure you use the Amsler chart for the macular emergencies because that might be the only way from a video consult that you will see that a patient has had acute problem in their macula. This is a patient that we saw this week. Uh, she's 89 years old and would certainly be in the higher category of, of, of risk. So, um, however, she's only got essential hypertension and no other medical history. So the treatment for her has been for a Fibrocept uh, ILEA injections and she's been undergoing this since March 2019. This original referral was for cataract surgery. And actually it's really important as we go forwards that any elderly patients have macular scans because it's quite likely that we will find something on the macula prior to surgery. And in this case, we haven't canceled her appointments. She's come in. I'm gonna show you her scans, which is this. In March, 2019, when she was first referred to us with 660 cataracts, this, this here on the right has a, pigment epithelial detachment and lots of fluid all over the side and just off the side of the central macula. On the other side, the left eye is actually not treatable because the cutoff is 6 over 96. So in this time period with COVID, these are the patients that we want to find, hook out, and if they're under hospital care, they should continue to have their injections. So it'd be slightly different for all the other hospitals around you. And it would be quite good to collate the shared knowledge, uh, like if you have a chat group like we do, what the other centers are doing and then inform Pratesh, et cetera, so that they can upload the information and you will know which services to send them to. We are looking after our own St. Thomas's patients, but if you do have somebody with an only eye and suddenly loses vision from wet macular degeneration, please call us because we can help you, okay? So then the wet AMDs are important to continue and safely and good social distancing, practicing all that in the hospital. We're only doing about 20% of our work and that's mainly VR and MR. So within the MR service, there's also the diabetics because the diabetic eye screening service has actually in all essence stopped at least for the next four to six months. We're going to have all the ones that are poorly controlled and at high risk that may get into trouble and all the five years or the last five years of diabetic screening and keeping them under control might just all be gone in six months because they are depressed at home, the fridge door is getting a lot of exercise, 
and they're eating too much, they're not controlling their diabetes. So if you get any phone calls and it's from a diabetic, go through your COVID questionnaire, go through their health and just check how their blood sugars are doing. If it's poorly controlled and they have sudden visual loss, then we need to see them as well. So the Nettle Ship Clinic is the, the retinal clinic at St. Thomas's and the extension is 84321. There will be somebody there every day, Monday to Friday, and you can ring up for advice or patients who are known to St. Thomas's who are diabetic and have had a problem in the community, please contact us. The deaf screening service is probably going to continue in some form um, separate to, to the general stoppage for pregnant and high risk patients. So again, just uh, these are just things that I thought might be quite nice to inform you so that you too can share with some of your other uh, max optometrists or elsewhere as you and us become essentially one whole group to help with sight threatening conditions. Now the diabetics could probably present with flotus and with the flotus, it's commonly due to vitreous hemorrhages from proliferative disease. If that happens, the classical symptoms will be there and you'll probably find this even from a telephone consultation or a video consultation. Now, if you find somebody whom you think has got an acute vitreous hemorrhage in a poorly di uh, controlled diabetic, once again, uh, send them to the eye emergency, but different from other times when you would have seen the patient and sent us a referral, you would probably send an email as well as telephone the sites so that they, they are aware that somebody who's diabetic and poorly controlled will be coming in. Now, a number of these diabetic patients might already have had some surgery planned because when you get severe proliferative disease, then you've got this kind of a scaffolding. Are you able to see the color from this photograph here? So there is this traction across there, and that's actually the blood vessels um, growing into the vitreous. So that's why vitrectomy works really well, because it's removing the scaffold from severe proliferative disease and then flattening out and reducing the oxygen demand. So if in your clinical history taking, not only do you find that it's a patient who's diabetic, who's perhaps had previous PRP, which means they had proliferative diabetic retinopathy before, and if they were scheduled for a vitrectomy to remove the vitreous gel, that puts them at significant risk for sites for sight loss. You know, the reason we list them for surgery, for vitrectomy, for diabetics, is that if we don't do that, this proliferative disease will not only go across the optic disc, go across into the peripheral retina, scaffold up into the vitre, and then they get tractional retinal detachment and permanent visual loss. So in part of your history taking, not only do you have to find out the ocular symptoms, the systemic risk factors, you also want to know what was being planned in the hospital. If there was a vitrectomy or surgery being planned, then it should go high up in your alert scheme. Hang on a minute, this patient might need assessment. Make sure they're safe COVID-wise and then make sure that we're aware they're coming so that we can rearrange and, and make sure it's at a time where we don't have too many patients waiting in the area. And these ones with the diabetic vitrectomies are as high risk as the uh, as the acute vitreous hemorrhage. Yeah, am I speaking a bit too fast or are you still following? I just would like to keep it to an hour. All good? Okay, so those are the, the VR. Um, okay, perfect. So these are all the MR ones. So, so think microvascular, everything microvascular. You're thinking strokes, you're thinking, um, you're thinking diabetes, you're thinking acute events, and then you're thinking frail and elderly. That's the that's the wet AMDs. So with the with the stroke type things, you either get a arterial occlusion or a retinal vein occlusion. Okay, so the vein occlusions are are boggy, fluid swelling. So if anyone's had a DVT before or a vein or clot in your vein, you realize everything swells up. It, it's um, full of fluid. The fluid leaks everywhere. And that's why you get macular edema. Okay, so with this branched retinal vein occlusions or central retinal vein occlusions, they happen very suddenly. And because it affects the 
the, the bogginess and the edema affects the central vision, you'll get a positive Ansler on your video consult. Okay, it'll be very clearly obvious. And it'll be, even if it's not a big one like this patient, his Ansler was only in a tiny little corner and he was referred to me as a cataract patient. But he did say, oh, I had this floater. And then there was this area that, that's constantly blurred in the center that I couldn't get rid of. And when we scanned his maculas, there was, um, there, this is the macular scan of the disc. And this, the one on the right is the macula. And with this huge, big boggy swelling, it was just a small clot actually. So the clot, the arter, the apologies, the retinal venous clots can be a small one like this one, which although small is the ciliary branch, which is very close to the macula. So it's only this area here between the nerve, the disc and the macula, a small part of the retinal vein was clotted off. Huge macular edema there. He actually flew back off to China because he um, he resides there and, and um, we couldn't get him his injections in time. But for him, you can see on this optic disc, there's some cupping and vertical superior notch at the top. You see, when we're thinking about microvascular patients, uh, yesterday of the injection clinic that I took part in, most of them had glaucoma and macular degeneration. So what we should do in this period where we're waiting and we're taking phone calls is to really think about risk factors. So when you have venous occlusions, the macular edema will affect the central vision. The central vision can be rescued if we give anti-VEGF treatments, but they need a loading dose of three consecutive, three consecutive injections, okay? So I know these are things that we might not previously have considered, but that's also important why you need to listen to the news because if everything goes into shutdown and the Excel center is full in three weeks time, it might slightly change if it's one eye or both eyes and being able to communicate that clearly so that we have a list of patients we can bring in safely uh, will become very, very important. So in this case, this gentleman, I advised him not to fly back to China until we started the treatments, but he was very insistent and he wanted to go. He had some serious business to take care of. And he left with just um, without treating his branch vein occlusion. But when I saw him, his blood pressure was 220 over 100 and, um, 105 or something like that. So the, the key thing for him was getting his blood pressure sorted out. It's difficult for you doing a video consult with the blood pressure not known to you, but you know that's something where where the GPs might come in um, with the whether whether the blood pressure medication can be can be given to the patients while we're waiting in a in a time where patients have have lost sight in one eye. There's a 20% risk of it happening in the other eye. And in some very unlucky cases, they could have both. So, you know, it's things like that to consider. Uh, Bovina just posted a question about the treat and extend. Yes, we're doing that. So we do the loading dose and ILEA allows the injections to be extended. Um, and Lucentis is only used for patients that have historically been on it. So even now we're trying to extend by two weeks for, for all the patients that are coming in and things that we would normally have done, for example, for vein occlusions, a very successful treatment is a steroid Ozodex injection. And when you give an Ozodex injection into the eye, you can cause other things like development of a cataract and you can also cause ocular hypertension. The normal pathway would allow us to give the Ozodex, see them in a month, and then see them at four months to repeat their Ozodex. The one month appointment is to check for ocular hypertension from the Ozodex injection. So yesterday I did an injection and it was a, um, a patient that both has already had 15 injections and her, her eye pressure has never gone above 17, but she develops uveitis occasionally after her injections. So in her case, we have still given her the appointment at four months, but we've cancelled the one month appointment because on balance, her risk of elevated IOP is not, not as high, yet her risk of uh, 
a rebound uveitis or a, a post ozodex uveitis is present. So I've given her some Drocodex drops so that she can self-treat. So how we're practicing now is very much um, linked in with how much information we have about the patient. You know, it's very difficult for new patients that we don't know to be able to give this advice safely. You know, if we skipped the one month appointment for a new patient that, that received an Ozodex, we might end up with uncontrolled glaucoma. So, you know, from a safety point of view, the patients that you already know in practice, as well as are already known to us at the hospital, it allows us to make safe decisions that is personalized for the patient care. Okay, so branch vein occlusions, central retinal vein occlusions, look out for them, they may happen. And if they do happen, then um, be a bit of a um, Sherlock Holmes to try and get past information, find out about possible steroid responses, if it's known from any past hospital letters and anything like that. The more information we have, the better we can make a judgment call that will be safe for them to, to sail past this period because um, it's about six months of uncertainty. And in this six months, all of us have a role to play to pick up the patients that will lose their sight in one or both eyes within the next two to four month period. Okay, now from the veins, um, you can also have an arterial occlusion. It's different from the venous ones because if you imagine like a heart attack, that's an artery, it goes bang, sudden onset. And if it is associated with pain, it could be something called giant cell arteritis or arteritic uh, inflammation and um, causing the artery to shut down and block out. So these patients would be quite elderly. They may be within the shielded group. They would have sudden onset and severe visual loss. If you've got pain and claudication, like this little cartoon over here, the inflammation in the arteries over 50 years of age associated with sort of um, aching jaw or pain radiating down and around the shoulders and very tender to touch where the temples are, those patients are at risk of GCA and, and their COVID status is important because the high dose steroids that we normally treat for GCA may be completely contraindicated if somebody was COVID positive, you see. So these cases, if you, you, if you have somebody call in and gives you a history that sounds like this, it's important that you can reach out to the medical professionals and for us, our a and &E will be staffed probably by consultants from the next few weeks onwards. Okay, so it's a really good time when all the routine non-urgent work has been reduced for you to really upskill and actually have direct contact with the consultants because most of my colleagues have all given me the okay for you to contact them on PANDO for anterior segment emergencies, etc., or oculoplastics or things like this or neurological things contact us, contact me if you wish, and, and we, will, we will take it from there and make sure that these patients have, um, have the care that they need. And what we need from you is, the, is a good background and the COVID questionnaire filled in and the referral from the pathways that we talked about. Now, everything that we're doing in this period is all going to be about risk factors. We talked about the risk factors for wet AMD, the risk factors for venous occlusions and for arterial occlusions, you can think about it a bit like a heart attack or a stroke. So these patients that have things shooting out the arteries the wrong way is because they probably have an irregular heart known as atrial fibrillation or they've had um, arthritis like the GCA. So one of the things you can ask them is whether they've ever had an ultrasound of their neck because that's quite specific for somebody to have a Doppler ultrasound on the artery in this picture here, the carotid artery. So if you've had a carotid artery stenosis or blockage, you're more likely to have shut off a little embolus that has got stuck in your retinal artery and caused a central retinal artery occlusion. You see arterial occlusions block off all the blood, no supply at all, complete hypoxia. So they just die off and you get this pale fundus compared to the venous ones where it starts to swell. So you don't get 
you don't get um, macular edema with arterial occlusions. You get them only with the veins. With the arteries, however, in some cases, you can have neovascular um, events. So the eye may be very painful because the pressure has gone up. So again, all of these will be symptomatic and they will be acute. And a careful history and a careful risk factor history will give you a lot of information that will help you in conveying to the people who are receiving these patients um, to do the best for them. Now, Natural Chip Clinic is going to be running all the time for us, and that's our medical retinal clinic. Um, if you can hear my kids downstairs, I'm really sorry. That's my son screaming. Um, give me a moment. Just going to message my husband. Oh, actually, it'll come down in a moment. Natural Ship Clinic extension is 84336. Now, 84336 will have consultants, senior fellows, as well as nurse practitioners. So any of those three things, thank you, Natasha. Any of those three things, a clot, a venous one with macular edema, amsler distorted, an arterial one, sudden onset, thinking like strokes, heart attacks, that sort of thing. Then, okay, perfect. <laughs> thank you, Patricia. So, venous occlusions, arterial occlusions, and wet AMD. Those three things, if we don't lose them in the community, we would have done very well. So, Samantha Mann, Moin Mohammed, and Nigel Davies are our medical retinal leads. Okay, so those are the people that you can contact. So, glaucoma urgence. With glaucoma emergencies, the big one is angle closure. That's also my favorite um, personal subject. Angle closure, glaucoma. For every one acute attack, there's 10 in the community. Unfortunately, at this stage, the narrow angles and the usual referrals that you send in with the Van Herrick's great one and, and the normal optic discs, those are people that we just don't have capacity to see. So if you have background information and it's somebody who's telephoned up and said, you know, I've been referred and I haven't heard from the hospital, it's really important that you give them lots of reassurance. The acute angle closures need to be seen and the ones that you suspect the pressure to be over 30 millimeters mercury. With acute angle closure, a lot of them will be little old ladies. So the video is actually quite helpful for you to assess visually the kind of ethnic risk. So a little Asian woman like me, if I become 75 or 80 years old, I would probably have a higher risk of angle closure than somebody who's, um, who's tall, myopic, and you know the opposite of the risk factors of angle closure. If there is a positive family history of glaucoma, think again, because that's higher, higher risk. Hypermetropia, which you might have in your records from having seen them for previous spectacles, etc. If there's been a gradual hyperopic shift and they, you think they have a small eye anyway, and then the Caucasian women actually are found that they tend to be more acute, whereas the, the Asian and the Afro-Caribbean population don't even get those acute symptomatic, they get more the chronic PAS type of angle closure. So, so the main thing is that kind of an appearance. If you've got an acute attack with fixed dilated pupil, corneal edema, etc., no matter what happens, they, they, they would have to come in because we cannot bring a PI machine to go and treat them up at home. Um, it just uh, wouldn't be feasible. And the other eyes also at 20% risk. Yeah. So acute angle closure, glaucoma, think about the risk factors. Primary open angle glaucoma are less likely to have any symptoms at all. But you want to think of the people who might go into the red clinic or the, the, the risk of visual loss category that I talked about sort of within two to four months. If patients have had surgery within the last four months, that's probably an indication that they were progressing even before this COVID thing. So if they've had recent surgery in the last four months and they've had clear letters from the hospital what to do, um, maybe the, the follow-up has been extended and they've been given a whole lot of um, post-operative steroids to use. If they're, if they're doing well, that's fine. If they're not and they already have advanced visual loss in one eye or any acute symptoms of infection, these are the case to look, cases to look out for. 
particularly in our patch in South London, we've got a lot more Afro-Caribbean people with advanced glaucoma. They don't even know it until the better eye has lost 15 decibels of vision. Okay, so they some of them might be totally blasé about it. You've all seen it in the community. You've seen the ocular hypertensions that worry themselves to death. And then that really requires your communication skill to, to tell them, don't worry if you don't get this IOP check, you'll be fine in the next four months. Whereas the ones who are already NPL in one eye may be the ones that are not using their eye drops at all, you know? And then you might want to contact us to discuss. And then um, there are a number of you who are also independent prescribers. So simple things like if they were already on maximal therapy in one eye, and a confusing regime with um, two drops on the left and three drops on the right, um, spending a little bit of time to talk to them on the phone, making sure that they're using the drops at the correct time and maybe maximizing their drops. So for example, people who are glaucoma suspects that might have been only on Zalatan in one eye, you know, when I review my letters and the people that I've canceled, I've sometimes written to them to say, please use your latanoprus drops in both eyes until further review because it might be another eight months before I end up seeing this patient again. And I wouldn't want the other eye to start to convert. Think about risk, think about patient risk and think about communications because that's how we're going to, to try and reduce the, the sight loss when we reopen again. So you know Miss Obi very well. I'm sure most of you have had received uh, notes from her before. Is that right? Hands up. <laughs> and Miss Obi would, would be a very good contact point. Uh, Ian, Surab, Sheng, and myself all do some good code. Uh, well, I, I do, I'm mainly a cataract. Um, uh, surgical, surgically, I'm mainly cataracts, but I also do glaucoma, glaucoma work and some of glaucoma surgery. You can contact me or Miss Obi as we're both directly responsible for the MEX um, program from the St. Thomas' side as well. So all the patients that are already on glaucoma medications spend some time to make sure that they're taking it at the same time every day and that they're using it with their daily routine. So I sometimes ask patients whether they brush their teeth if they brush their teeth, then I ask them it's, it's once or twice a day. If they manage to brush their teeth twice a day, then close up twice a day when you brush your teeth. You know, making sure that it fits in with what they usually do and, and getting the prescriptions from GP. If you're stuck with that, we can also have prescriptions posted to the patients from St. Thomas's Hospital. So you can call the glaucoma clinic, which is Iris Clinic. Um, and there is a telephone number that you can talk to one of the team or an answer phone. So if it's just a repeat prescription because a, a patient is struggling with their GP and you don't have IP yet, then ask them to leave the answer phone message with their details and then we can post a prescription for them. But in your uh, communication with us, if you can be clear what the patient was on, um, you know, the specific, the generic or the non, and um, the patients might not, might not, know the drops so well themselves you know spend a little time to make sure of what is in the correct drug history and hopefully we'll also have records on our epr we've only gone to electronic medical records in the last year and right now we've no staff pulling paper notes so the the information that we can gather as a group of eye care practitioners and the accuracy of it some patients might say dorsolamide because COSOT is called dorsolamide stroke timolol on the generic formulations and they might call it dorsolamide. So, you know, all of these little things, because we actually have a little bit more time at the moment with all the usual um, haste of spectacle prescribing and day-to-day -day business, not, not really a, a high pressure environment, take some time to listen and, and get the correct information to the patient and to us and vice versa. So Thomas Wright is one of our champion secretaries and if you email him at this address, um, almost certainly you'll get to us and the glaucoma team and we'll make sure that your patient gets the drops that they need. If they're not known to St. Thomas's and you think they're in acute angle closure, discuss with their nearest eye department and if you're struggling, let us know and others can still be referred routinely in existing 
processes like ERS, but just um, a little warning in that the ERSs from the last four months would not have received appointments yet. And if we keep referring on ERS, then we're going to have a huge burden and the acute emergencies that need to see us uh, won't get the slots. So I guess in a way it's making us think about how we use our eye care resources as efficiently as possible. Now, anterior segment things. Uh, one simple thing for everybody to spread the message about is contact lens. So if patients come to you for contact lenses and spectacles, you might want to maybe ring them or write them a letter to say, in this period, if you need a new pair of spectacles, get in touch with us because we would advise you not to wear um, contact lenses. We can only give you your last prescription because you don't want to be within two meters refracting a patient because re, uh, preventable contact lens associated keratitis is a simple and a huge thing that we can do as a community. I know there's tons of people on social media going for these one pound contact lenses and it makes me go, oh, oh dear, um, a bit like the Halloween contact lenses that people just wear without the awareness. So the, um, the, the patients that you know very well under your care for contact lenses, you might just want to send a letter to say, um, to say reduce your contact lens wear because of the risk of contact lens associated keratitis at this stage. Okay, and then the other thing we talked about before was the, um, the what was it, contact lenses? Sorry, I'm, I'm reading the messages popping up and, um, and contact lenses and um, acute infections for the corneal service. So there's 88771, that extension is for the eye clinics. If there's urgent appointments, there are patients that are under the corneal team or something more serious or corneal grafts that have had sudden problems, um, things like that. You can also contact our consultant colleagues here, which is David O'Brien, Manny Bogo and Scott Robbie. Okay, so the role of MEX for now would be as community champions, we need to prevent sight loss and actually this might transform completely the way we practice in the future. It's an opportunity to upskill for you know the time that I have. Normally I do this for you every eight weeks or so and now I'm committed to doing it every week until I'm not able um, because of other sort of medical priorities we need to be thinking about forward planning. So in the next three to three weeks, we're expecting a surge of COVID patients in the hospitals. I think right now we have several hundred already. Um, the last count was 200 a week, so it might already be 400 um, and up to 600 in, in the next week or 10 days. So as we become busier as medic, medics that need to go on the front line, we need you to be thinking about decreasing the burden of non-urgent conditions that might previously have been referred from MEX to hospital eye services. We're going to try and support you with actually caring for them within the community. So myself and Seema Verma and Aladi Azan and Adana Obi, uh, we're thinking of looking at video consultations so that the patients that you would normally have referred for say asymmetrical cupping but everything else is normal whether we can do a video consult and check that medically we're happy and then giving you very specific advice like see in six months and then etc so giving you information of what can be done in, in the community as continuity rather than bringing them up to hospital so so when we restart, it would be a bit like this COVID emergencies, and then we slowly expand back into the regular services. We have already been talking to Charles and the rest of the CCGs to get our post-op cataracts into the community, um, partly because that's where they need to go for their glasses after cataract surgery anyway. And, and you're the first port of call for sending referrals into the hospital eye services there will be a pressure to increase the amount of output and how much surgery that we do. Like many Bogle and myself are the high volume surgeons. We do about 16 on a Saturday all day. And the consultant led ones are usually a, a straightforward pathway, list surgery, uh, post-op, list second eye and discharge. So there are potentials for uh, totally uncomplicated cases to have 
list surgery both eyes post-op in your practice but itself comes with a whole load of training it itself comes with a fair bit of commitment from the optoms because safety is still utmost even in crises and when they're stretched resources we still need to keep our services safe so we are going to be designing post-op cataract services but the first things that you might get referred back are post-op retinal detachments so that like i said the mr and vr services are the only ones that are going still at practically full steam um, just with appointment slots slightly longer to to practice the good social distancing and some of the vr appointments would have been seen at two weeks and then six or eight weeks and if this partnership between max and has becomes very good it may be that we can give you all the information that you need so that we check that at two weeks everything is flat then at eight weeks you can check again and help us with a pressure reading and their their vision and and the discharge back into the community so our vr surgeons stretch as far out to frimley park and to maidstone and tunbridge wells so if you have max or or you know specialist optoms in those areas who are your friends as well um <clears throat> and you want to introduce them to our vr surgeons i think they'll be very happy to 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 have those contacts and as as well with you guys if there are anything in areas in particular that you're interested in it helps me to feedback and plan our services and um the communication lines so far have been with joe bovina pritesh and primary eye care services they've already updated the website with maxsouthieastlondon.co.uk to update for emergencies and patients um Pritesh has just uh, update said about the new guidelines so what kind of patients need to be seen in practice etc um yes so we still have two weeks or three weeks to prepare when the medical staff reduce and your contribution may increase so we're going to um yeah we're going to we're going to continue that and and that will be your single point of access utilization becoming more important we're getting the gps to ring into that phone number and and for for you guys as well to organize and it seems to be going really well because the communications that have gone out and your participation to these webinars have all been particularly encouraging so at least half of all practitioners are already on board so i want to really thank you from the bottom of our hearts because this is a, an opportunity to transform and actually make everything better for the way we practice and how we manage the patients waiting four months for a routine thing doesn't seem to make sense and it also blocks up the services to blocks up the services for people who really need to be in hospital so the priority standards need to be followed the wet amds because everything else is cancelled if you do have them we should be able to see them the prescribing audits um we're going to continue working on risk stratification so within within max as well it might be quite useful for you to look into the patients that you've recently referred to us and then let's have a communication whether we can give you the advice so that on your video consults you have definitive backing from the consultant body what we would recommend for you to do so clinical responsibilities for discharged patients um there's still this um that's why the trust and open communication between hospital and community optoms and ophthalmologists um training probably needs to be stepped up and we're already rising to that so i'm very pleased with our discharge letters we will be committed to sending you diagnoses clinical information making sure you know what the treatments are and specifically when you need to see them again and what to do and when to refer back for example the ones like vr if pressure goes over this or if they start developing cataracts within the six months then i often receive the vr um post post retinal detachment surgery cataracts because many of them have a lot of refractive uh, refractive areas of the consultation that, that are just not great in a general pooled cataract list 
because they might have significant anisometropia with the upper eye and the risk of detachment in the second eye, etc. So, you know, I guess what we're planning in the hospital is to give you comprehensive discharge letters because those themselves act as educational tools. And also in our communication, your clear documentation and your writing to us and our writing back to you is actually our pathways for checking our, our continuity, our accountability and making sure people don't don't fall off the fall off the loop it falls back down to information governance you know using nhs net email addresses using the normal forms that you use for referrals and sending information through the email addresses because that all serves as a tracking um, for us to be able to track that our letters have got out to you and the addresses are correct and for us to be able to see the communication if if something unexpected happens in the time that we're looking after these patients. So I have a little bit of homework today, if you don't mind, is that I've actually been going through all the email, um, all the outputs that Pratesh has sent of your referrals from last year until 9th of March this year. And there are hundreds of those. So if each practice, I think 40 of you are on, 42 of you are online at the moment, if you have your laptops and you do have access to the people that you've referred onto ERSs, if you can send us a list of people that you think you, you personally could manage or discharge um, via video consultation, then do send it to us. For me, it's sansi.lo at nhs.net. Then myself, Seema, Adana, etc can support you with that and that also takes away the mechs that don't need HES and might also help to increase your confidence in looking after them and keeping them within your practice and and we will continue to do all the teaching around site threatening conditions. I haven't covered neuro yet, um, uh, Sui Wong has just um, messaged um, and, and she, and I will find out more from our team, conversations about flashing lights and floaters. So Pratesh has, has messaged something about flashing lights and floaters. Yes, in those patients, we would have to give the, the retinal detachment warning advice. Okay, so firstly, logging their symptomatology, the time they call up is important. So if a 65 year old rings up and they go, oh, I've got this single flash of light, some floaters, and it's still there, um, and I've not had any surgery in either eye. So that's something you might think is a normal physiological occurrence of a PVD. And you would log that call, you would write down all the information that the patient gives you, you go through everything as the normal process, COVID questionnaire, the medical history and other risk factors, you have that all logged. And then you give them the advice that if this increases or worsens, please ring either your personal practice, if they've already been filtered into your video consult practice, please ring X number. And then if your history then tells you that there's increased floaters and more flashes or reduction of the vision, then they come in to see us. Okay. However, a person with a slightly different category of risk factors like a 35 year old minus eight myope, you might see that there's like flashing lights and floaters and they're telling you that the flashes are continuing. They're still having persistent continuing flashing lights. Those are the patients that you might think, okay, I better talk to the, talk to the hospital eye service and this documentation that I've already prepared, I'm gonna send it through to the eye secretaries because then there is a pathway for that to be picked up if the patient attends at St. Thomas's or King's or wherever, that you would send it through because you think that the risk of that is higher. So the myopic retinal detachments or the pseudophagic retinal detachments, somebody who's under the age of 60 that had cataract surgery is at much, much higher risk of detaching their retina than somebody who's had age-related changes, no previous eye problems and a single flash of light at the age of 65 to 70. So flashing lights and floaters, um, it, there's not much you can see unless you do a full slit lamp examination, which right now is probably not advisable. And even with things like optos photography to take 
the peripheral fundus photograph, great if you've picked up a tear and you can see the detachment, but if you don't see anything on the optus, it's still, uh, it still could be a small tear or a small break. So that's really important that you document your conversation with them about the flashing lights and floaters and that it could progress and what are the things to look out for. Persistence, worsening, and you can also give them Amsler grids because that's telling you their Mac off. Ideally, we don't wait that long. High risk ones that have these, we would rather see them. And the VR fellows, as you know, are always, always keen. And in the last week, we've only done one retinal detachment. I think people are sitting at home and they're worried and they don't know who to call. So if you have a concern, you can still call a &E and they can direct you to the VR fellow on call or how you previously referred for VR, VR fellows as well. Nobody will mind talking you through a case and nobody will mind it either if they have to make an arrangement to give a time and date for a patient to come in. So a bit like you guys are all in communication now, all of the VR fellows and consultants as well are already making plans for retinal detachments in Southeast London. So don't be scared to, to reach out and um, it's Mr. Laidlaw, Mr. Wong and Tom Williamson, who are our consultant leads for VR. And uh, there are three or four VR fellows and they're used to being on call one in three and they're used to getting multiple detachments a day. So, so if you're worried, send them in. So we need to put in COVID in our clinical decision making and then consider the age. Exactly. Okay, very good. So this is taking us um, up to one hour. And are you guys happy to, to think about doing some of those things? Would, would some of you do the homework? Any hand raises to look at your past referrals and then maybe step them down? Yeah, so step them down. Perfect. So that's something that we can... Perfect. That's that's something that we can activate and also gives us a starting point for our next webinar because like there weren't there weren't any questions um, from when I opened this last week, but going through specific cases might actually bring up more questions. So try and collate them in a way that's easy for us. Um, <laughs> um, exactly, kids homework. So try and collate them, and then if if you've got specific teach questions, try and split them into two particular categories, the ones that you think are urgent and the ones that you think you can step down. The in-betweens are much harder to do, so we can do that. We can do that as we progress with this. Is that okay, everybody? Good, so one more thing I could show you, which is fantastic. And what date are we going back to? uh january 1st so so homework is for 1 1 2020 onwards okay look through those referrals and for the last three months because that gives you uh some um a pool of patients if you like already that you can manage and it also gives us the direct checking of the ones that you sent as urgent whether we met it so we can we can make that as our formal three month audit yeah, perfect. Okay, so Pratesh has offered some help. And then the last thing I wanted to show you was the, uh, this Optom sharing files. Um, let me add another file, which was this. this. Contact points like you have at St. Thomas's. Um, yes, I have. So for King's College, it's usually Genevieve Larkin who does Max, and many of you will know her very, very well. She's also the head of department, so she's particularly busy at the moment. So the next person along would be Gerasimos. Uh, yes, exactly. So Gerasimos Lascaratus. So we've been in com communication. I can send him what we've done for St. Thomas's, and maybe he can do something similar for you for King's. Okay, so this is a Excel sheet. Yeah, this is an Excel sheet of the various high risk ones. It's pretty much what we've covered in today's lecture. Glaucoma, high pressures, acute angle closure, post-ops within four months. Okay, and then the medical retina, we talked about a lot of that today. For the Nexel team, the um, Miss Susie Morley, uh, VJ Varg, 
and Danny Morrison are our Nexo colleagues. If you see something that you think is a tumor, the best thing is to refer them to, to more fields because they are not a COVID center and they still need to be seen on the urgent pathway. Okay, so at Nexo cancers, think about more fields or vulnerable patients that are COVID negative. Uh, you might also want to think about calling more fields um, because Kings and St. Thomas's are super high um, profile COVID centers. So oncology, we cover general ophthalmology, urgence, pretty much we've cleared all that um, with all the patients that that needed sorting out actually in the last two weeks have been sorted already within our service. VR was still open for the traumas, things like that can still happen. And then pediatrics, vision loss and sight threatening things, cellulitis, etc. You don't have to worry about conjunctivitis and COVID patients. It's so rare. It's actually very, very rare. Um, and there's also not much need to see all of those. You can give advice over the phone um, and just work out if it's bacterial, viral, etc. But don't bring them in. So neuro-ophthalmology, um, I'll catch up with Sui and update you on that. And then the uveitis team are particularly worried about known patients. So Pratesh will give you a link of all the people who can prescribe. So things like pan uveitis that have recurred. Yes, we'll definitely share this. I'll put this up on the contents page, okay? So then the posterior uveitis that have recurred and need steroids. Prof Stanford is very keen that in the community you have some people who can provide this. And, um, and then contact lens, you know, like I mentioned earlier, there's not much indication for contact lenses. Um, if you don't need them at this time. So glaucoma, asymptomatic disease, these are sort of the medium risk patients that right now, both sides are not really paying too much attention to from the hospital side as well as the MEC side. But it's not a bad idea to upskill in terms of if patients need to be seen and it's an area where we can do safely in the community, uh, we'll come back to the medium risk patients. So medium risk patients are likely to be the ones that need a consultant uh, phone call or consultant video, and we're happy to arrange that and we can have them as booked appointments. One thing that occurred to me was that we could have them, because if it is a video consult, we could actually have you join in at the same time that we call the patient. That really then provides continuity of care. So it's something that we might be able to pilot at least for the people that you've referred to general ophthalmology and the people that I've cancelled in my clinics for the next six months. Okay, and then these are the medium risk oculoplastics, et cetera, medium risk anterior uveitis. You know, um, they usually have to come into A&E if it's a, new, it's a new presentation, blurred vision, um, painful red eye. So the low risk patients here, and this is on a spreadsheet that can be shared with you guys. Um, lumps and bumps, chalasia, and all of that, we're going to be seriously upping the self-care side of things so that patients can take this opportunity that they've had in the last two weeks and the ongoing 10 or 12 weeks to, to look at ways that they can look after lumps and bumps, prevent blepharitis, etc. Macular holes, at the moment, we're not doing any surgery for them because they're considered low risk and possibly elective. But if they've... Um, uh, if, if they're delayed for too long, the best outcomes for macular holes are sort of within 12 weeks of the onset of symptoms and Emsler, Emsler distortion. So you might pick up an, a macular hole on your video consult with Emsler distortion because it's either um, macular uh, um, and then the history will tell you if there's been inflammation or um, ERMs happen if they are diabetics or if they've had a PVD. So taking a good history might give you some suggestions of macular holes. They are low risk at the moment, but those are the ones the retinal team will probably want to see when they restart operating again. So if we do manage to set up that the VR surgeons can do lots of the surgery and we can debulk some of their clinics with the second follow-up in the community, again, we'd like to know how many people are skilled enough to perform this. There might be a sort of commitment that, that having people come into the hospital so that um, the teams know one another and know how we practice. 
Now, there, there are other logistic things to sort out, but this is a very good opportunity for us to think about our surgical pathways with cataract and VR, how we can make use of your excellent abilities and skills in the community. Okay, so the last bits are the uveitis and contact lenses. We're trying to delay them if we can. So MEX will be mostly mostly telephone consultation. I think in the next few weeks you'll be thinking in terms of your personal protective uh, equipment, more guidance coming through, uh, what you will see face to face. Um, things like the tumours, take a picture, send it in. Uh, translations. Um, yes, possibly. So I will bear it in mind with interpretations. Um, so oncology, general ophthalmology, VR, etc. So these are just ideas that Joe has put down for for Max. Um, you know, things like refracting. All of this is maybe. It may be that something that we get to a point where you are able to do that. But for now. For now, concentrate on the emergencies and concentrate on the work that we haven't been able to do, which is the homework that I set earlier today. Okay, so we've run over about six minutes, but we started about 10 minutes later as well because of IT issues. Hopefully, Pratesh managed to video record this for you. I have certainly recorded the voice, so I can send the PowerPoint. I can put the PowerPoint up as a resource for you to download. And I can also put this uh, spreadsheet, which is kind of work in progress, but we will upload it and put it in. And this was an originally from the clinical leads of London as we, as we started planning the reduction of our services. Okay, good. So I think that's that. And I'll put these up on our, that's a great step with relationship. Okay, fantastic, Uma, yeah. Yeah, perfect. So we've got something to chat about when we meet again in a week or so. Yeah, perfect. And then and then all the resources are going in a stepwise manner. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you all. All. Yeah. So I guess we're going to out of this pan pandemic. We will we will find an army of people to fight for sight, fight for sight. Okay, perfect. Great. Okay, so uh, as Kureshi had a question, you can email.